Amen. Well, okay, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Cliff, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Radiant City. Um, it's a joy to preach the word this morning as we continue on in our sermon series that we've titled The Songs of Christmas. And as a reminder, and for those visiting with us this morning, the word Advent simply means the coming or arrival of something. You could say that all of us Advented here this morning, so thank you for coming. But biblically speaking, for centuries, Advent has been a time historically when the church has taken time to celebrate what Jesus has done and that he has come and that Jesus has promised to come again. And so we've taken the four Sundays leading up to Christmas to celebrate Advent, joining in with the Old Testament saints of the past in longing anticipation for Jesus' first coming, while also joining in with the New Testament saints as we look forward to Jesus' return. We all long for the true king to come back to rule and reign, to make all things new and to ultimately usher in this new kingdom for all of eternity. And so if you have your copy of God's word, go ahead and meet me in Luke chapter 2 with the Collins family just read. We're going to be in chapter verses 25 through 33. If you're there and ready, go ahead and say amen. And if you're not there, say, Lord, help me, and somebody will help you out, all right? Before, before diving into God's word, I just want to lead us in a time of prayer and ask God to bless our morning and time today. <clears throat> Would you bow with me? Father in heaven, we love you. And we're so thankful to have this privilege and the desire you've given us to gather as your people this morning. Father, I know that there are people here from all walks of life with different backgrounds, cultures, and experiences and yet, distinctly, we're all here looking to be led by you. Many of us waiting, waiting to hear a fresh word, waiting to hear a direct word from you. And so, oh Lord, would you let the meditation of my, the words from my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our God and our Redeemer, speak through your servant today. Would you be glorified and would your people be edified? We ask these things in and through Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Well, church, a few weeks ago, I went to go visit a dear brother in Christ at the hospital. He was preparing to have surgery, and I was hoping to visit with him, encourage him, and pray for him. I figured I'd just go there like I normally do when I go to the hospital visit, show my ID, get checked in, and make my way up to his room. But as I approached the receptionist in the waiting room of the hospital, I soon realized that that was not going to be the case. The hospital only allowed one visitor per day, and it just so happened that my friend had already had a visitor that day. So what did Pastor Cliff do? I pulled out my invisible pastor card, and I said, hey, I'm a pastor. I need to pray with this person. Let me, let me, let me in. To which the receptionist pulls out her, I'm just a receptionist card, and says, baby, that's above my pray grade. So she hands me a phone card and says, you need to call this person. And after four different phone calls, I finally get in contact with somebody who could approve my request. And if I'm being candid, and I'm keeping it 100 with you, after each phone call of getting the runaround, my frustration got a little bit more and more. After each phone call that I made, my patience kept getting thinner and thinner. You know, I was smiling on the outside, but that eye started to twitch, you know what I'm saying? I was inside, I'm like, Lord, please don't let me lose it here. I already told this lady I'm a pastor. Holy Spirit, activate. Holy Spirit, activate. Well, finally, on the fourth call, I get to the right person who says, hey, I can't make you any promises, but here's what I can do. I can come down in 30 or 40 minutes, and I can then give you an answer. To which I'm like, are you serious? Are you joking, 30 or 40 minutes? And she's like, yep, see you in a few minutes. Church, I was in a waiting room. So ironic. I was in the waiting room, but I did not want to wait. You know, this, this week while preparing for this message, God's really made me aware of something, something that I've always been aware of, church, but it hit me like a pile of bricks this week. God showed me that I have a waiting problem. Radiant City, I don't like waiting. I really don't like waiting. And the truth is, if we're honest, in and of ourselves, I don't think most of us like waiting either. In our culture today, we do whatever we can to avoid it and to receive what's called instant gratification. We do not like waiting. 
I mean, just think about it. We don't like waiting in traffic. I mean, we definitely don't like waiting in line. Church, we don't even like to wait when we watch TV these days. Now you can pay for a subscription so you can skip all the ads and the commercials. And, and what's that phrase we all like to say? I can't wait. I can't wait to get married. I can't wait to see the new Spider-Man movie, which, by the way, was good, but a little over, overestimated, just saying. We can't wait to retire. For our parents out there, we can't wait for our kids to get potty trained. Amen, somebody. And we can't wait for our in-laws not to overstay their welcomes during the holiday time frame. Did I go too far saying that? Maybe I did. You know, I was talking to a, a, a homie of mine, one of my friends, his name is Mello, and we were chopping it up and talking about this this week. And he was like, Cliff, he was like, man, you know, the only thing I've seen masses of people willing to wait for is, I said, what, bro? He said, Chick-fil-A. The line will be wrapped around the whole entire building. It'll be wrapped around the whole entire shopping center, but we will wait on the Lord for his chicken, right? It's anointed. Amen, somebody. I get it, right? But all jokes aside, church, seriously, contrary to what the world tries to throw at us, for the Christian, waiting is part of our ongoing walk with Jesus. Oftentimes, we aren't comfortable with waiting. We don't like it because we feel like it's pointless, or worse, we feel that it's getting in the way and that we're missing out on life. However, church, understand this. It is in our waiting that God grows us to what he desires us to be. It is in our waiting that we grow and see what God ultimately desires for us. It's in our waiting that he has you to teach you to trust him again, to use waiting as the very means of your sanctification. All in all, church, Radiant City, waiting is for our good. Listen to what Lamentations 3 and 25 has to tell us. The word of the Lord says this, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And so this morning we're going to look at an example of a faithful man who waited well. In Luke chapter 2 we're going to find this elderly man by the name of Simeon who gets to witness the arrival of Jesus. And so prior to Jesus' coming, the Lord had made it clear to Simeon that one day he would see the long-awaited Messiah and that he wouldn't die until he saw this Messiah face to face. Church, Simeon had been waiting a long time, much longer than 30 to 40 minutes. Some would say his entire life to meet Jesus. And after faithfully waiting on the Lord, he waited, his waiting would be over and he would get to see God indeed. He would get to see that God is true to keep his promises. And so here's the big idea. If you're writing notes, here's the big idea for this morning. Our willingness to wait on the Lord reveals the sincerity of our faith in God and our trust in his promises. Our willingness to wait on the Lord reveals the sincerity of our faith in God and our trust in his promises. As we look at the example of Simeon this morning, I want to ask everyone here sitting in a seat a question. What are you waiting for, Radiant City? What are you looking forward to this Christmas season? Is it that next vacation? Is it getting married? Maybe having a child or a grandchild? Is it getting that promotion at work? Church, all of these things are good things to wait for. All of these things are good things to accomplish in life and our blessings from God. But I want to tell you this morning that real contentment in life comes from knowing what to truly wait for. Are you waiting on the Lord this morning and holding him to something that he's never promised in his word? Or are you waiting in something that he has promised, something that is sure and something, something that we can put a stake in, that you can put your trust in and your hope in? The first truth I want us to see in our text is this. Number one, Our waiting is part of our worship. Our waiting is part of our worship. Read with me, starting in verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, 
look at this, waiting for the constellation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Radiant City, let me tell you this morning, outside of these 11 verses, we know nothing about Brother Simeon. We know he was a prophet. But here's what the word of God says about him. It says that Simeon was righteous, he was devout, and that he was a man full of the Holy Spirit. So what does that tell us? Simeon was a worshiper. Simeon was dedicated to obeying God's word. He believed God's word, and he believed that the God, God was a God of promise, and he had this rare gift in this time in history of being noted as a man who was filled with the Holy Ghost. This old man was enabled and empowered by God to serve him in great ways. And so I don't know about you this morning, but as a believer, if I could have a one-sentence resume, that's the one I need, amen? You feel me? Like, that's the one we need. Like, imagine if I said, hey, man, you know, we're walking around. Do you know a, a brother named Cameron? Oh, yeah, that's the guy who's righteous and devout and filled with the Spirit. That's all I need to know. I want to talk to Cam. You know what I mean? Let me ask you this morning, church. If, if somebody's reading your God's story, what would your one-sentence summary be? Would it be the complainer? Would it be the, the person who has no hope? Would it be the person who's joyful, the person that's an encourager, the person that's always known for building up? Would it be, what would it be? What would God have to say about you in one sentence? Simeon was waiting for the constellation of Israel, church. The CSB says it this way, that he was longing for the consolation of Israel. Simeon was waiting. He was longing. He was anticipating. He was expecting and he was hoping. He was counting the days, if you will, until this consolation of Israel took place. What is the consolation of Israel? I'm glad you asked. Because some of us are reading that. We're like, what is that? Here it is. It is. The consolation is the hope that God would come to rescue and comfort his people through the Messiah, Jesus. The people of Israel had been suffering oppression for years by their enemies, and it was primarily and largely their fault due to their rebellion. And here we find Simeon patiently waiting for the deliverance that Christ would bring. Just imagine, church, the anticipation that he had after the Spirit revealed that to him that he would not see death before he got his eyes on the Lord's Christ. His waiting was part of his worship. Radiant City, generally speaking, worship can be defined as rightly responding to who God is, what he has done, and what he is calling you to do. And I really believe as when we have the proper perspective on what it means to wait, that waiting is part of our worship. It'll help change us and put us in the right place when we're called to wait on the Lord. You see, church, that's why it's so important that we, that we watch just how infatuated we get with the things that we're waiting for, quote unquote. Here's what I mean by that. Like Simeon, it's totally fine for us to have this kind of longing anticipation as we wait on the Lord's return as we are in this Advent season. It's totally fine to wait on the Lord as a good gift giver to provide for us and to protect us in the way that he brings those gifts. But here's what's not okay. It's not okay for us to worship those things. It's not okay for us to worship our jobs, our resources, our girlfriend or boyfriends, our, our spouses, our, our families, or things that we long for that just may never, ever come to pass. Church, this is because whenever good things become God things in our lives, you know what they become? Idols. Whenever good things become God things in our lives, they become idols. And idols being the sin that they are, they always over, they, they always under deliver. And they never bring it through the way we want it to because they're not God. Romans 125 warns us that worship, that we're not to worship and serve the created things over the creator. And family, we worship the gift giver 
not the gifts themselves. Amen? Even in this Christmas season, we don't worship the gifts under the tree. We worship the one who hung on a tree. Why am I saying this? Well, because we can see from today's passage that Simeon is likely an old guy. He's likely been around the block, and he's been waiting for this promise to come likely for many, many years, perhaps his entire life like I shared. And if that's true, we got to be honest. Y'all mean to tell me that you don't think Simeon was ever tempted to doubt God and what God had promised him? You don't think that other good things and desires were likely placed in front of him that may have tempted him to misplace his trust in God and his promises? Church, you don't think the devil was trying to use whatever he could to manipulate Simeon to undermine God's plan and choose his own path? Beloved, we only have 11 verses to look at in his life, but I can, I'm pretty sure that the enemy threw whatever he could at Simeon. Radiant City, when we wait on the Lord, our faith will be tested. We'll be called to persevere. And when we're tempted to not wait on him, it's a great opportunity for us to worship him. So if bills are tight and you haven't got the promotion at work you've been longing for, whatever you do, continue working with all your heart as unto the Lord and not for men, since you know that you're going to reap an inheritance in the Lord because you're serving Christ Jesus. Ladies, if he hasn't put a ring on your finger, if he hasn't asked you out on a date, continue seeking God. Don't change your values. Don't lower your standards. Your heart should be so hidden in Christ that your future husband should have to seek Jesus in order to find you. If you are a people, if you or people you know are, are suffering and in pain or going through really challenging seasons, keep praying in faith, knowing that the prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman is powerful and effective and that God is our ultimate healer and that he is able to answer your prayers. Radiant City, it's in the face of adversity that our faith is often tested and where we're called to wait on the Lord and worship him as we do. We're called to look at Jesus. We're called to look, as, look at the people of God, the church, to live in community. And we're called to look to his word, which leads us to our second truth this morning. Number two, our waiting is always rooted in God's word. Our waiting is always rooted in God's word. Verses 27 through 32, we see Simeon, he finally gets this chance to see the Lord's promise fulfilled. Look with me, starting in verse 27. And he came in the spirit to the, into the temple. And when the parents brought in the Jesus child to do him, do for him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. I just want to stop there for a minute. You know, this scene, Cam actually really got me to, to really look closely at this scene. I, I love this scene. Simeon meets Joseph and Mary in the temple, and, and, and don't you envision Simeon seeing Jesus, that he's this, like, awesome old grandpa kind of dude just scooping up Jesus in his arms, staring deeply into the eyes of our Savior? He's literally holding the true line of Judah in his arms. You know, for me personally, I didn't grow up with a grandfather. They both passed away before I could remember. But I've seen my dad hold my son, little Judah, and look at him in his eyes when he was really young. I've witnessed the joy that he had in, 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 in seeing him and in embracing him and, and in loving him. How much more, how much greater do you think it was when you're actually holding Jesus Christ himself? Listen to what Simeon goes on to say as he prays and blesses God. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Don't, let, don't skip over this. According to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, Jesus, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Simeon has been patiently waiting and trusting in the promise God gave him. But get this, that promise was always rooted in God's word. Church, our faith, our trust, our hope is rooted in what God will, will and shall have come to pass. And that's always rooted in his word. Do you take God at his word this morning? 
Do you regularly read God's word and allow God's word to read you? Do you know the promises that God has given to you as his people? The psalmist in one, Psalm 130 verse 5 says this, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. But then the last four words is, in his word, I hope. Five words, my bad. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word, I hope. And so when we look at the Bible, when we read the Bible from front to back, when we look at it in its entirety, there's something that's always important for us to remember. There's always a gap between what God declares and what he does. There's always a gap between what God foretells and what he fulfills. Here's where I'm going with that. Simeon likely waited for quite some time for this promise to take place, to come to pass. But church, we got to remember that God's people have waited so much longer, thousands of years. We see the first messianic prophecy come to pass in, or, or told rather, in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When God says to the serpent, he says this, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Radiant City, the offspring that's being prophesied here of the woman refers to Jesus. And his heel being bruised points to Jesus' death on the cross. But we know how the story goes. In a crazy turn of events, thousands of years later, Jesus' death and resurrection will result in the devil being destroyed. The serpent's head one day will be crushed. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that even though God's promises might seem delayed from our perspective, even though we might have to wait a long time to receive them, if God said it, you can take it to the bank. Wells Fargo, Chase, wherever you at, you can take it there. Every word he speaks will always come to pass. And as I was thinking about it, I just said, here are some promises that God has made to us that I think I, I just want in this Advent season for us to just embrace in our hearts. God is always good, Psalm 119, 68 tells us. That's a good promise to remember. He's always good in all things that Pastor Cameron shared in his, in his prayer. In all things, God is working for our good. God is always faithful and always can be trusted, Hebrews 10, 23. God will never leave us nor forsake us, Deuteronomy 31. God is always with us, Joshua 1. God will always fight for us, Exodus 14. God gives us strength when we're weary, Isaiah 40. God always provides a way out for us when we're tempted, 1 Corinthians 10. Amen for that. God designed us for a purpose, Ephesians 2.10. And God loves us, Ephesians or John 3.16. Those are good promises to hold to, and there's so many more in the Bible. But on the flip side, I think we can all agree that man's promises aren't the same. Our promises to one another aren't the same. Even with the best intentions, we bake promises and even forget the promises that we made. This is why we can have a hard time waiting and trusting God. There's four dangerous thoughts I want to talk to you about about waiting. Just really quick, four dangerous thoughts, four slippery slopes that we can have when we begin to doubt and wrestle with this concept of waiting. Number one, we can think that waiting equals wasting time. That's just a waste. Like, I can just go ahead and do this and take things into my own hand. Number two, when we, when we start to wait, we can begin to wonder, is God really in this? Is he still with us? Is he still with me? Because it sure don't feel like it. Then when, as we wait, we can be, begin to believe, like, is something going wrong? Like, I'm, I'm reading my Bible, I'm in a city group, I'm coming to church service on service, I'm pursuing the Lord, and things like are worse than when I was in the world and not doing things for the Lord. So like, is something wrong here? Did I get it wrong? Do I got the wrong Bible translation? 
Or lastly, this is the one that happens too, is you begin to worry. Waiting can lead to worrying. Wasting time, wondering, did I do something wrong, and worrying. Proverbs 16.9 says this, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Church, let me ask y'all this. Like, I don't want y'all to be honest, all right? I want some hands up or, or, or not up, all right? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought you or someone else had the, the best plan or you wanted something to happen so bad and you're, you're looking to do everything possible to somehow make it happen, but then at the last minute, God just closed the door on you? And maybe you were mad at God for a season. Anybody been there? Anybody? Oh, we got some honest people here. The rest of y'all are not being honest. But then months, years, or maybe decades later, right, you look back and you're like, thank you, God, for closing that door. <laughs> thank you, God, for closing that door. Woo, won't you do it, God? As I'm speaking to you this morning, maybe you're saying to yourself as you're thinking about this, woo, praise God I didn't marry that person. Praise God I didn't take that job. Praise God I was late to that meeting and I missed a 20-pound car up pile up on a on on highway that could have knocked me out. Praise God that I waited and did my due diligence before joining that church. Their theology was way off. Whatever it is, you say, thank God for closing those doors. And so we wait on church. We wait on God, church. We wait on God. Waiting is for our good, but most importantly, is for his glory. I think one of the reasons why we don't like to wait is because we have a misunderstanding of what it means to wait. But here's the right way to process waiting. If you want a definition of waiting on the Lord, waiting on God means to not go outside of God to resolve our issues. Waiting on God means to not go outside of God to resolve our issues. That's the negative perspective of it. The positive side of it is, is, is obeying God while we wait on him to do so. Waiting is not inactive, but it's actually inactive. It's an active verb that, you, that says that you might not be aware of all that's going on in your life, all that's occurring around you. You don't know all the answers. That's why you're waiting. But you're submitting to God to lead you on where and what he wants you to do. Church, it takes faith and it takes work to wait. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. It can be so challenging to wait. I know a lot of our stories in here, the partners in here, and the things that some of the things that you're walking through, we talk about it as pastors, and I'm just sharing, man, that is tough. It's tough when you want something to change your circumstances or change your situation. It's tough that when you want things to get better in the midst of your hardships. But I just want to encourage you this morning to stay the course. Don't try to take matters into your own hands. It may feel like God is silent, but God is never still. If you're walking with him and you're waiting, you're worshiping him. That's good news. And in your waiting, know that God is working. He's doing something that's bigger than you in the world. That's why we need to embrace the sovereignty of God that even in the bad things, if we're following him, he's doing something for our good. And so while you're waiting, God is working. He's doing something that's bigger than you in the world while simultaneously working in and through you as he molds your hearts and conforms you more into the image of Jesus Christ himself. Here's something bigger than ourselves to think about. Notice that in verse 30, Simon doesn't say that he's seen the Messiah. What does he say in verse 30? But rather that his eyes have seen God's salvation. Simon's showing us that through the birth of Jesus, God is revealing himself in his salvation to the Jews and to the Gentiles. He's saying that Jesus is going to be a light for all peoples. That Jesus, seeing Jesus, is seeing salvation. If you remember in our Ephesians series, the Gentile people were outsiders. The Jews were so, went so far as to call them dogs. They deemed them as unclean. 
But we know that the Bible teaches us that all are unclean because of the stain of sin. Amen. Romans 3 makes it crystal clear that all, that's everybody walking the face of this planet, is dirty. We've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news of the Bible. But the good news is this, is that the darkness of our sin can be overcome with the light of Christ. If we'll simply turn from our sins and we'll trust in Jesus, everyone is welcomed in. Everyone. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Church, we live in a world today that's marred with division, exclusivity, and polarization. And yet deep down, people are looking for something else. Ecclesiastes says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. We know that we're created for something greater. We just haven't found it. A lot of us haven't. And what's beautiful of, about the gospel is that Jesus brings the one and only solution. He invites all who will receive him to have a seat at the table as equals, as co-heirs, as family, and they get to receive eternal life. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's slave or free, no male or female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. That's why at the beginning of today's service, I celebrated the diversity of the body because we're all so different, and yet we're one in Christ. Simeon's been waiting on this day forever, church. Jesus is the consolation of Israel. Jesus is the one who would come to comfort and console God's people. Simeon says in verse 29, he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. Do you know what Simeon's saying right there? Know what he's saying, church? He's saying, I'm ready to die. He says, I've seen what I need to see. He's saying, the fat lady has sang and she sang her heart out. He said, this is way better than Adele ever could sing. Jesus is saying, peace, deuces, I'm ready. Simon is saying, Jesus is really worth it. And that's the question we all ask about waiting. Is it worth it? Simeon is saying it's worth it. He said, I see what I need to see. See you later. I'm gone. Thank you. Take me away, Lord. He says, I knew it by faith, but now I've seen it by sight with my own two eyes. And that's what I want to leave you with this morning, Radiant City that our waiting is worth it. It's worth it. It is worth it. Verses 33 through 35, read with me. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them now and, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword that will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts for many years may be revealed. Church, waiting for Jesus, waiting for the Lord, it's worth it. But I'm not going to lie to you, it does come with a cost. Joseph and Mary are amazed at Simeon's song and, and the blessing. And after praising God in song, Simeon turns to both of them and he blesses them. And in a nutshell, he says this, he says, hey, I'm letting you know that the world is going to be brought to a crossroad because of your son. They're going to be brought to a decision. And what I want us to see here is that Simeon's prophecy reveals the ultimate purpose for why Jesus was born. Jesus was appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. Church, salvation comes for the humble and the meek. The humble and the meek, they're going to be exalted. They're going to rise in the resurrection as we read in our text. But the haughty and the arrogant and the prideful, they're going to be judged and they're going to be brought low. And as Jesus continues to grow and continue to fulfill this mission that God's given him, he's going to face more and more opposition. And Jesus is going to function as a type of cornerstone for those people who trust in him. But he's going to function as a stumbling block, a stumbling stone for those who reject him. And this will ultimately lead Christ to his death on the cross. So in this Advent season, we do mourn with Mary, whose soul is pierced, understanding that one day her son would die, that one day her son would be pierced on the cross. But we also, too, rejoice because of the sacrifice of her son, God's son, multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of sons and daughters will be saved from their sins. And that's good news. You see, the reason why Jesus had to die is because God is a just God, 
and sin had to be punished. We deserve to be punished for our sins, but out of God's scandalous grace and mercy, he allowed our punishment to be placed on the shoulders of his son, shoulders that can truly carry it. Isaiah 53 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. Some of us this morning are asking ourselves, is Jesus really worth it? Is Jesus really worth giving my life to? Can I trust him? And in love, I just want to remind you, yes, he is, and yes, you can. And I also want to ask you that question that we started off with. What are you waiting for? Only you can answer that question. Listen, I can't promise everyone here that trusting Jesus is going to give you earthly security immediately. But I can guarantee that it's going to secure your soul for all of eternity. Our God is a healer. Our God is a provider. Our God is a way maker. Yes, one day he's going to make everything right. Every wrong he's, he will make right. Everything that's old, he will make new. Everything that's broken, he will restore. He specializes in restoring broken relationship, and he has the power to heal. And even if he does it on this side of eternity, he'll walk with you in a special way in the midst of your suffering. That's his promise. He can provide for the poor. Jesus was poor. We know that, right? He became poor so that we might become rich in him. Jesus can break the chains of addiction that you have. And Jesus can give you a brand new reason for living. So instead of leaving here, church, with wishful thinking as we think about the holidays in this Advent season, wishful thinking that your life will somehow get better, my plea this morning is to humble your hearts and place your faith in the one and only one who has the ability to make things different. That's who we want to wait on, church. And if you're in Christ this morning, understand that the, our Lord in love is patiently waiting with you. True love always wait. And I don't mean that in the cliche way that the world says it. God waits with us perfectly. You know, isn't it interesting in 1 Corinthians 13 that the first thing that's said about love is that love is patient, that love is kind? As you look back and as you reflect on your life before we get ready to take communion here in a minute, I pray that you see just how patient and kind God has been with you and that his patience and his kindness would lead you to repentance this morning. First Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all should reach repentance. Church, waiting is a true sign of patience and love. And we have an opportunity to respond in faith this morning. My encouragement is to remember that waiting is part of our worship, that our waiting is rooted in God's word, and that ultimately our waiting is worth it. Let's pray, family. Father in heaven, we come to you so thankful this morning, um, knowing that you had every right to take away the earth, that none of us deserve a relationship with you, that none of us deserves your love, quite the contrary. And yet, in your divine wisdom, in your miraculous and magnificent understanding, Lord, from the beginning, you've always had a plan to restore and reconcile your people. And so, Lord, I just pray that that would, um, would humble us this morning and that would bring us to our knees in gratitude. Um, Lord, that even now, as I'm speaking, you're showing mercy and kindness and patience with us, Lord in our walk with you. And Father, I pray that we would see that that patience, the waiting that you've demonstrated for us as an example, the patience that you give us the ability to exercise is the fruit of the spirit that is ultimately rooted in the love that you have for us. Father, forgive us this morning, Lord, for not being patient with one another. Forgive us this morning for not waiting on you when, and taking matters into our own hands. And, Lord, I pray in a special way that this Advent season, this Christmas season in 2021, that as we look towards waiting, as we see it as worship, that you'll begin to do something new in our lives and in this city as we seek to reach South Florida and beyond. 
we ask these things in and through Christ's name. And the church says, amen. Amen.